Now, we want to come to showing you how differences come about. And there are many, many reasons. We can't, in an hour, we can't go into all of them, but there are many reasons why this. So I'm just giving three differences of the companions, and I will give you three differences from the, the, the mazhab. And I think that should suffice to give you a general idea of the flavor. So there is this hadith which the Prophet Wasallam said that the deceased is punished due to the crying of his house members. And so if you're a house folk, there's somebody that die and you start crying and they start to wail and get on, then the Prophet Wasallam said Allah will punish that dead person because of the behavior of the family members who are behaving inappropriately. And so Aisha radiallahu an and Ibn Umar narrate this hadith from the Prophet sallallahu And Ibn Umar considered this to be a general rule that every person who dies and if their household behave, then this is the rule and the deceased will be punished. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, no, this was a very specific situation. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu was talking to this Jewish woman and so he was telling her this is what is going to happen to her family because of how they were behaving. And that this rule doesn't apply across the board. There's something called am and khas, general and specific. So she said, no, this was not a general rule by the Prophet. So of course they have a general difference of opinion. And Ibn Omar says, no, this can be applied across the board. Aisha says, no, it's just a one-time specific situation. So that's how one difference may come about. Another one is, for example, we have learned and heard that the Prophet Wasallam there was a deceased person passing and the Prophet Wasallam got up uh, for that dead person. And it was a disbeliever. And so the Sahaba uh, had a difference of opinion about this issue as well. So one said, said I think the Prophet Wasallam stood up because there was angels present. And so he stood up as a respect of the angels that was present in the gathering. So that would mean that any deceased that passed, whether believer or disbeliever, we will stand up for it because the angels will be present. So they had that, but they was of that opinion. Whereas another group says, no. The reason why the prophet stood up was because he didn't want a disbeliever to pass that was above us, because that's a sign of humiliation that this disbelieving person is going to be a sitting and this disbelieving person is going to be higher than us. So the Prophet stood up to show that we are higher. And so he didn't want to, to for that disbelieving deceased to be look as if they were above us. So in that case, if a Muslim pass, there's no reason for humiliation. So you would stand up for the Muslim because there's no humiliation in this particular case. But for the disbeliever, we will stand up. So now they have a different perspective. And so that's how you will get these different um, positions. Um, then there's, a, for example, a, another case in where um, the, as I mentioned before, that the Prophet Wasallam, when he passed away, they had a big problem. Where do we bury him? And they had all kinds of discussion among themselves, Abu Bakr and all of them deciding, what are we going to do here? And then someone remembered a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam that said that prophets are to be buried at the spot where they die. And so the discussion ended right there. And so they buried the Prophet Wasallam at the spot. The disagreement was over. Um, so you, that's how some of the, the disagreement comes about. Um, there are many others, you know, like whether you can recite Quran holding it. Um, Aisha Radhiallahu and had someone who used to recite the Quran with a book holding it, and then the companions differed about this. Um, we'll come to that. Um, so that's uh, some some simple ideas of how they get the differences come about. As for the Imams. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll give you three. We're running out of time almost. Uh, one of it is, for example, there's an ayah in the Quran in the second chapter, verse 228, which mentioned, 
rabbasna bi anfusihinna thalathata quru and this means divorced women should wait three quru <clears throat> the imams differ about what quru means because it has two meanings it means the period of menses and it means the period of purity so now they have this dispute about how we going to what does allah mean by three quru and so abu, abu hanifa says the period of menses he considered it to be the period of menses quru so he says you have to wait until three quru pass so he would wait until the end of the menses because it has the menses is a period at the end of the period of the menses before the um the, the person who is divorced can continue with their lives whereas the other imams they said no it is a period of purity so what they would do is instead of the end of the menses the beginning of the menses because that means purity now is finished menses begin and so they would rule that that's the period when they can continue with their life and so that's how you get like one a word that has two meanings and some of them would adopt one meaning and the other one understand it to be of another meaning. There is this word called lams, which is mentioned in the Quran that you touch women. If you touch and using the word lams, uh, I can't find water in relation to making wudu, making wudu, then tayammum you should use. So the problem now is this word lams, and lams has two meanings. If you touch a woman, or if you have sexual intercourse with a woman, so Shafi, he says, touch means to touch the hand and the body. And so they consider based on this ayah, and I have the reference here, it's in Surah Nisa. Based on this ayah, touching, if you touch some hand or, or with the flesh of, of a woman or her body, any part, you got it, you would do broke. Because of, of the understanding that lambs here, he means touch, physically touch. Imam Shafi says, no, touch, yes, it means physically touch, but he has a condition. And he said, only if it was done with pleasure. Because the Prophet ﷺ used to move Aisha's feet away. He would touch Aisha's feet and he would move it out. And he said, well, there was no pleasure there in terms of sexual pleasure. And so he make a condition to it and said, only if the touching is done with pleasure, then the wudu breaks. Abu Hanifa says, no, no, this has nothing to do with touch. This is sexual intercourse. And so touching does not break your wudu. Because this, this touching here doesn't mean it has anything to do with physical touch. And so if you physically touch uh, a woman, it does not break your wudu. This is referred to sexual intercourse. So that's another way in which a word has a figurative meaning and a literal meaning, and they differ on it. Um, I mentioned just now about the Aisha case. Um, Aisha radiallahu an used to have somebody reciting <clears throat> from a copy of the Quran. And so the Imam Malik, Shafi, and Hanbali, they said this is allowed because Aisha did it. And of course, she uh, is the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu and she would have had the Prophet's approval. So they made that assumption, so it's acceptable. Abu Hanifa says no. For Aisha herself never mentioned that she got this approved from the prophet and it could be that this is something she did on her own she never said that the prophet tell her to do this or approved it so he said no it's not allowed so in the hanafi school it's not allowed to hold the quran and recite the salah this is about salah like holding a copy of the mushaf and then re using it and reading it whilst you're leading the prayer uh, like tarawi a lot of people they do that they will hold the quran physically and follow along when the imam is reading they would be in the saf and they would hold the Quran to keep track of that. And the Maliki and the Shafi and the Hanbali allow it, but and the Hanafi says no. So that's how some of the differences will have. And there are hundreds and hundreds of differences like that. Um, how much uh, Allah saying Allah Akbar, putting your hand, say Shadun la ilaha illallah. There are many, many differences. For example, in Janazah, when you go Janazah, you hear people say, um, either read Surah Fatiha or read Sana. And the reason why, because the Hanafi school of thought says that Janazah Salah is not Salah. You know, the, and the other schools, they said, no, it is Salah. And so, and because it's Salah, the Prophet says, you cannot have Salah unless you have Surah Fatiha recited in it. So the other school said, this is Salah till Janazah. And so we will recite Surah Fatiha. Abu Hanifa says, no, Janazah is Dua. 
It doesn't have ruku, it doesn't have sajda, it doesn't have the definition of salah. It is really a du'a, and so you can't have Quran being recited in this here because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never recited, and there are many other hadith about it. So that's how they would come about. So when you go to Janaz, you will do one or the other. And that's how many of the differences will come about. Lastly, I want to mention that uh, in terms of the mazhab, so they formulated their uh, different schools and then eventually what happened because ijtihad, as I said, was, was shut down because unqualified people were making uh, ijtihad, the governments at that time decided, you know what, we're going to regularize this. So they shut down ijtihad and they said only these four imams, only their schools will be accepted. And they went to such an extent that they began to glorify these four men and said, look, these four school of thought was actually divinely ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They even went to the extent of saying those who don't follow one of these schools would be out of the religion. And so what they encouraged is for people to blindly follow one of the imams. Don't criticize, don't add, don't subtract, just follow the imam. And so the people began to follow one or the other of these imams and what happened is that it became so intense that they begin to see each other as different sects in islam so to the extent that if you are a shafi you will not allow your your child to marry someone who is a hanafi you know they were like an imam who is a hanafi you cannot leave, pray salah behind him if you are shafi you cannot pray behind each other like that in fact, in the Haram, they had four different positions, north, west, east, south, in which each one of these four mazhab had a place. And so they would actually pray when they're praying Maghrib, they would have four Maghrib. Isha, four Isha. So they would have one Imam pray Maghrib, then the other Imam would pray, and then they would have each of these school of thought praying their separate Salah because they were not praying behind each other. Until 1924, when this was abolished, and then you had one Salah. That was the extent of the kind of hatred and animosity that existed between the people who were following different madhab. They just believed that they was right and there was no other way uh, for this to be done. Now there is a group of people among them, believers, who are called Ahl Hadith and they reject all Imams. So they said, we are not following any madhab. We're going to go directly to the source and interpret Islam directly from there. This is uh, it's, um, something which a lot of people do, but the problem with it is that you have to be a learned person, a very learned person to be able to do that. Or else what you are doing is develop a next method. So the Ahlul Hadith, there are people who, and a lot among them, they are not learned. And so they end up rejecting all the mazhab outrightly and end up trying to find a way to practice. And so they pick and choose and they, they, they just do all manner of things without any really basis. So the Ahl Hadith are people who exist and they, they follow no mazhab. What is really the ideal is when you be, to become learned enough to critically follow a mazhab, where you don't blindly follow, that you have the ability to disagree with the position of the Imam based on your time and climb. But if you, uh, you know, so that is what is desired. That we need to have those learned people. They have the ability to do that. And so it's fine for them to even critique the imams and their positions and to come up with new ones based on their own um, present ishtihad and reality. For us as the lay person, here's what we are recommended to do. If you're a lay Muslim, without any deep knowledge, you should follow one mazhab. And there are many books of fiqh available with them that you take one fiqh a sunnah every day fiqh there's so many of them around and you take one of them and you follow them a lot of us uh, come from guyana and trinidad and in the caribbean or from pakistan and india and most of those people are hanafi mazhab and so a lot of us we are more familiar with the hanafi mazhab and they, when you see shafi and maliki and hanbali it look very strange you know, but if you are a person without too much knowledge, um, and you don't have deep knowledge to do this, then it is recommended you just follow one mazhab. Number two, don't pick and choose between mazhab unless you have knowledge. Because what's going to happen is that you're going to say, I like this position for 
Shafi and I like and I like that position for Hanbali. What you're going to be doing is that you don't understand the philosophical basis of these decisions, so you're actually going to be contradicting yourself because this opinion may be because he didn't accept weak hadith, so you take it because you like it, and then in the other position you're accepting weak hadith. So you are having position of um, in this case I'm accepting weak hadith, in this case I'm not, and so you will end up at cross because you. The whole basis of how they arrive at these positions, if you don't have the intelligence and the knowledge to, to, to know that, it is better to stay with one mazhab and follow it. Any one of the four mazhab you follow, you will be rightly guided and they will all take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's jannah. So it's not that one is better than the other one or whatever it is. Any one of them you follow, you're safe. The, each of their positions is researched and has a basis for it. So you don't have to worry that if I follow Imam Abu Hanifa, that they're going to go astray or, or Shafi, all of them are, will take you to the path, the right path of Allah subhanahu and keep you on the Surat al uh, What is important, as we mentioned before, is for today's scholars to be able to find solutions to the multiple problems that we have and um, to find new solutions based on the time, place, culture, circumstance, and environment. Now, over a little bit, I just have one last thing. To give you a quick idea of where the Hanafi school is, the Hanafi school is the largest, not because it's the best, but because of a particular historical context in which the Mongols and they came to India and they declared Hanafi as the, they were rulers who declared Hanafi as the, the, the school of thought for the masses. And so historically, they became more people practicing the Hanafi not because it's said that Hanafi is better than the other. So you have Syria, Palestine, Bangladesh, Turkey, Pakistan, Egypt, Central Asia, Russia, Jordan, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Iraq, India, the Balkans, and the Caribbean, of course. You know, um, and then the, the Maliki school as mainly North Africa, West Africa, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Upper Egypt, and Kuwait. And the Shafi, you will find them in Brunei, Indonesia, very popular um, school. Indonesia is the largest Muslim populated country in the world, Shafi, Malaysia, all those countries around it, uh, Singapore, Thailand, Somalia, Philippines, Lower Egypt, Egypt is peculiar, and different parts of Egypt got different school of thought, Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, Western Egypt, Yemen, Palestine, Jordan, Southern Arabia. And then Hanbali, which is the least practiced by people, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Iraq. And um, a lot of the Salafis, Falafi brothers, they come from this school of thought, um, from, from Saudi Arabia mainly. So there's an idea of um, where the school of thought comes from. So uh, I want us to... Be